So hello again, um, people in the room and people online. And hello, David Maroto, who's our guest today, um, actually in the room, which haven't happened too much uh, during the COVID times. Um, David is going to talk about the artist novel today, and he brought um, his PhD that uh, yeah is on the artistic novel um, and comes with two volumes or in two volumes. The first one is a rather um, academic um, approach to the artist novel and the second one is um, an actual novel. So it's a rather fictional attempt to um, discuss the concept of the artist novel. Um, yeah, and afterwards will be a Q&A. So we have a 10 minutes break and um, you'll find the link for it in the description. Yeah, no, I don't have anything left to say, but um, <laughs> happy that you're here and um, we switch over to you now. Yes, um, is the sound okay? <coughs> if I speak like this, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, <coughs> so thank you. Um, Pia and Till and thank you Sparta and the Kunst Academy Dusseldorf for having me today here and have the opportunity to speak and discuss my work and my research with you today. I'm very happy actually that we can be in the same room. Um, yes, my name is uh, David Maroto. Uh, I am a Spanish uh, visual artist. Uh, I'm a writer a curator, a researcher, but I like to simplify everything by just simply saying that I'm an artist, and that's it. Um, so in 2011, I was doing a residence in uh, ISCP in New York, and then I had a curator coming over to do a studio visit uh, this curator is Joanna Sielinska, she's a Polish curator, and then at the time I was working on a novel called Illusion. The thing is that, I, I won't tell you the story because, uh, but just enough to say that I didn't want to write a novel. It came about as the result of an art project. Um, and then, of course, as always, when you have uh, an interest on something, you start to see examples of that something everywhere. So I started to see more novels written by artists and they called my attention. And just out of curiosity, I wrote a little list of like eight or 10 titles. And then, uh, but it wasn't intended to be a bibliography or anything. It was just to satisfy my own curiosity. And when Joanna saw this list, she thought it could be the beginning of uh, research, meaning how many artist novels are there why do artists write novels? And, um, and a lot of other questions that I will try to explain today. But uh, say that that was the beginning of our collaboration under the name of the book lovers. So I'm an artist, she's a curator. And, um, and then uh, we started, we soon realized that we wanted to research the artist novel, right? Uh, uh, and then we realized that uh, when we put it in Google, there were no results. There was no bibliography, there were no books, no exhibition, no art theoretician, no art historian, no art um, critic, no art curator had ever paid attention to this. Uh, so we started making a bibliography. Uh, today it has 612 titles uh, uh, with artists from all around the world. And we also created, parallel to the bibliography, a collection, a collection of artist novels. So it's the physical proof that it's not a concept, it's not an idea, it's a material practice that people actually do. Uh, so this collection has been acquired by the Museum of Contemporary Art in, uh, in Antwerp. Uh, it's called MUCA. So uh, yeah, it's, an, it's the only collection of artist novels in the world and is, yeah, it's, it's part of a museum collection now. But um, along with the collection and the bibliography, we've uh, organized a lot of uh, exhibitions, uh, public programs, uh, commissions, uh, publications, etc. 
But before I continue with this story, I feel I should clarify what I mean when I say art is novel. Okay, so we are all on the same page. Uh, by the way, there is a little bit of echo. Is it annoying you as much as it's annoying me? There is no solution to this. Okay, <laughs> then let's get used to it then. Um, okay. So, um, when I say the, uh, the artist novel, I don't mean a novel that is written by a visual artist. That's not an artist novel. That is simply a novel written by a visual artist. And um, so in that sense, it's not different from a novel written by a sailor or a novel written by a doctor. It's a still, it still belongs to literary parameters. So uh, in that sense, uh, we have novels written by visual artists since at least uh, William Morris. So we are talking about the 19th century. Um, so when I say artist novel, I mean something a little bit more specific. And it's those instances in which the novel is employed as a medium in the visual arts. So imagine, for example, that you have an art project, and in this project there is installation, performance, and a novel. Yeah? But the novel is inscribed in an artistic discourse, not literary. The artist is employing elements, novelistic devices, elements that uh, are traditionally ascribed to uh, literature at the service of, uh, uh, of, an, uh, of an art project. Um, so I'm going to give a few examples now, so you see exactly how it actually works. But I think that has to be clear in our mind that it's a very recent, more or less recent phenomenon. Uh, I think the first artist who created artist novels is probably Liam Gillick. So we are talking about the mid-1990s. There are a few pioneering examples, but I think the first one to use programmatically the process of writing uh, his novels as part of a, a, a artistic process is really Liam Gillick. Um, so you have to um, imagine, like I said, that the only exception when I started researching this was an article published by Maria Fusco, who later became my PhD supervisor, <laughs> no, no, not by chance. Uh, but apart from her article, I never saw any specific mention to the artist novel, even though, like I said, I already found 612, and it keeps growing, yeah? So this uh, creates a kind of anomaly, because uh, if you think about it, um, artists, and you will see a few examples now, uh, operates, when they employ the artist novel, they, they operate uh, from ignorance because they are not teachers who can teach you anything about the artist novel. Think about, for example, the situation with video, yeah? If you are um, a student and you are interested in video, um, there is a wealth of knowledge out there. There are books, there are anthologies, there are exhibitions, there are teachers. You can learn something about the uh, video as an artistic medium. So that when you use it, you will um, build on that knowledge. You will make a, con a, a, a hopefully a significant contribution, not by reinventing the wheel, not by doing something that Nanjung Pike did 60 years ago, but by building on that existing tradition. So knowledge is necessary. Does it work now? It seems to be that. Okay, but you hear me, yes? Yeah. <laughs> um, so knowledge is always necessary if you want to, uh, as an artist, if you want to make a significant contribution. So with the artist novel, the anomaly is that people have been so far operating uh, from ignorance. Like uh, I spoke to many other artists who created artist novels and they had never seen any other examples of that. So they, they were not in a dialogue with other artists. There was no possibility for them to relate or build up or respond or expand. Uh, I think it's changing now, partly because of the work of the book lovers <laughs> and partly because of the book that we will talk about in a, in a moment. So people are more aware now of, of it, but not 10 years ago. Okay, so um, I hope there will be more questions along the way, but I hope this kind of clarifies. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, just a couple of more things. Um, 
if you think about the crossover between uh, uh, visual arts and literature when it comes to poetry, that has never been a problem. Poetry is just another literary uh, genre. But you have visual poetry, concrete poetry, surrealist poetry, and again, there are books, anthologies, exhibitions. That has never been a problem. But when it comes to the novel, there has been, there has been th hundreds of artists who actively do it, but there has been a critical silence around it, okay? Like, there is no discourse. There is no possibility, and that was the problem I was facing 10 years ago that when I wrote my first novel, Illusion, people thought I had become a novelist <laughs> or a writer. And I couldn't explain why I was an artist who writes. Because again, the critical vocabulary that al would allow me to do that didn't exist. So that's why I started the research, uh, this research project to create, say, the, 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 the discourse, the possibility to speak about my own work in artistic terms, not literary. And along the way, I realized that I was also helping a lot of artists <laughs> who were in the same situation. Um, okay, I'm sure I'm forgetting things, but uh, if you have questions, I forgot, just raise your hand. It's okay to interrupt, so uh, whatever comes to your mind, you can reserve it for the end or just ask now, um, whatever you prefer. Okay, so... Let's go back to the book lovers. Uh, so now you know the situation we were uh, facing. And then, of course, um, one of the questions that um, you may realize that the research uh, poses is, how do you show an artist novel? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not going to show you everything that we've done with the book lovers. I will show you just a couple of examples. This is the most recent project. Um, it was in Granada, in Spain. So as you see, uh, we acquire always two copies of every artist novel, and then uh, one remains always in the museum in Antwerp, like I said, in the MUCA. Uh, it's part of the collection. And the second copy we use to circulate it in external exhibitions, like this one. So what we create is a kind of, I don't know how to call it, installation, reading rooms somehow. Um, so all novels are available for public perusal, okay? We, we know you can't, it's not the place to read a whole novel, yeah? A, a gallery or a museum. But at least you can browse the, ex the, the, the collection. At least we want to give this freedom to people to actually read if they want. The only exception, uh, so you can see here that people can just uh, take a, a novel and read it if they want. The only exception perhaps is uh, a few collectible items we have. They are either too expensive or too rare or too difficult to find. And we have been uh, robbed a couple of times <laughs> before is the risk that you take. Um, and then we realized that people were not uh, stealing at random. They were uh, stealing things that it was really hard to find again. Like we buy a novel now, and in five years, it's a collectible item. Like it, instead of 50 euros, you pay 2,000. It's crazy how it goes. So we, uh, sorry? Yeah, 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 exactly. People, uh, yeah, they, they knew what they were doing. So now, well, we learned the pain, in a painful way, and now there are a few items that we cannot afford to lose, so we just put them under the glass, but as you can see, for the most part. Okay, so what we do uh, also is to uh, try to uh, give uh, like entry points to the collection, because as you can imagine, 612 novels is a bit overwhelming. So, uh, well, it's not a very academic way, but we organize them, as you can see here, by uh, novelistic genre, like fantasy, memoir, erotic, uh, science fiction, whatever. So again, it's not very a, a very serious or academic, uh, but it, it, it works in that people maybe are curious, like, oh, science fiction by visual artists, I'm going to, well, okay, that's an entry point. But also, uh, in this particular exhibition, we trained a number of performers. So when you enter the room, there was a, a performer, you, you wouldn't tell, this person would uh, come to you, and this person would have a script uh, conversation in their mind. You don't know it, but they ask you if you want to hear a story. And if you say no, the performance is over. <laughs> 
if you say yes, then they have a scripted conversation that guides you through which novel you would like to be read. So eventually, uh, you might be sitting down and the performer will read a passage from the novel that you potentially wanted to hear. Could be uh, Leonora Carrington or Salvador Dali or whatever. We train them in reading um, 14 novels. Yeah, so um, they know the passage they have to read and how to, they, we've been training them and then it's a one-to-one -one performance, yeah? Well, sometimes two people, but it's a very intimate performance. It's happening for you. And I think people found it very soothing somehow. Maybe they fall back to childhood memories. I don't know <laughs> when they were reading to you. I don't know. But, uh, well, this, again, is just a way to make the whole collection more accessible, yeah? So at least maybe you don't get the whole novel, but you get a fragment is being read to. Maybe you want to continue later, whatever. Um, <clears throat> oh my God, I'm so slow. It is, <laughs> well, <laughs> look, <clears throat> at nine, if you are tired, just tell me and I <laughs> cut it off because I, this should have been five minutes, actually. And it's already 15. Okay, so uh, this is another project I wanted to show you. Um, here in Krikoteka, uh, it's a museum in Krakow, in uh, Poland. What we did was a group show, but only with three artists. Uh, because normally what artists, the problem they face is that they, they don't have op uh, many times opportunities to show the whole narrative that accompanies their projects. Uh, so audiences normally have only access to fragments of those narratives. Uh, you have to um, understand that many times the artist novel is at the center of an art project. So the relationship with the rest of works uh, is dictated by the terms of the project itself, but um, many times there is a whole body of work that is interconnected by a common shared uh, narrativity, and then the novel will give you the key of that narrativity. But again, artists many times have only the opportunity to show because, uh, because many of these projects uh, go on for many years. So you can only get bits and pieces. So we thought, okay, instead of having a group show with many artists, let's have three, but they all have enough space to display you know, the whole thing. So uh, here we have uh, Lindsay Sears, uh, English artist, uh, what is interesting is that this was a, a video installation you would enter, yeah, through the ramp. What's in, what is interesting about this one, um, her project is called uh, It Has to Be This Way. So what is interes interesting is that at the exit of the video installation, well, if you want, I can read you a little bit what the um, video installation was about. Um, So in her novella, uh, the protagonist uh, suffers from amnesia after an accident, and she uses old personal photographs to, uh, as, as, as if she was playing tarot um, in an attempt to recover her memory and call back her lost identity. Um, these images form the narrative structure of the film, the novel, and the installation. And what is interesting then is that um, her novella is not available in bookstores. It's only available at the exit of her uh, installation. So she makes sure that if you are going to read it, first of all, she is aware that the gallery is not the first, it's, it's not the best place to read it. You will read it at home later on. But then she's playing with the memory that you have of her installation, being mixed up with the experience of reading her novel. You see what I mean? So by not distributing her novel as an autonomous piece, uh, as a book in a bookstore or a library, um, she makes sure that you have it all. You have the experience of the uh, installation and then the novella you will read later, but the memory of the images and sounds and the stories that you saw will be part of the experience of reading her novella. Um, but again, this is her own unique, exclusive approach. I haven't seen this done by any other artist. And again, this, what I called before, like ignorance being a creative factor, that's how it works. Like maybe now some of you will get inspired by this. You might do something similar, which is fine. But 
now we are in a different situation. When she was doing it, there was no book lovers, there were no book, uh, there was nothing. She was just, you know, just uh, uh, doing it because uh, she thought it was the best way, but not because she got inspired by any other artist. So Cheng Rang, uh, he uh, uh, also uh, had this big installation, uh, Circadian Rhythm. It's uh, an, an artist novel that he wrote, and it's at the center of a body of work that, um, so all these works played the role of non-written chapters uh, of his novel. Um, so for him, it was very, very important uh, to explore the physicality of writing. So you see this um, uh, sort of carpet is actually the first page of his uh, uh, novel. But also this big structure is actually a reading room. So he thought, uh, and there you see a copy of his uh, artist novel. And for him, this was the best condition to read his novel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you would go into this kind of a spiral structure and then uh, read it there. Um, I don't know exactly why, but this is according to the artist. So he created the phenomenological conditions, yeah, the, the, the physical surrounding uh, uh, that he thought is the ideal to read his uh, artist novel. Um, are there more images of him? Yeah, and then like I was saying about specializing or um, uh, the text, yeah, to, to take the to uh, to expand the narrative beyond the space of the page. Yeah, I think that was a very important idea. So hit or miss is um, a sentence f literally from his novel, but it becomes a sculpture. Uh, Cheng Ran. And uh, this is Jill Maggit, the third artist. And here, uh, uh, her novel, uh, her, uh, sorry, artist novel is Failed States. It's a memoir in which the protagonist is the artist herself. In a visit to Austin in Texas, she witnessed a strange shooting by a young man called Fausto Cardenas. His bullets were aimed into the sky, no one was hurt, and Fausto was arrested. So in her installation, uh, Jill Maggit creates the connection between Fausto Cardenas and Faust, the protagonist of uh, Goethe's um, play, which was written as a closed drama meaning that it's a theater play that is not meant to be actually performed on the stage. It's a closet drama because it's meant to be happening in your mind. So um, this is all present. Well, here you see the bullets, the images of the sky, and then a sound installation that was the reading of Faust by six different people creating this kind of... Uh, well, the, the idea of the closet drama was also because only Fausto knew the reason why he was doing this strange shooting. Like even through the trial, it, was never clarified why he did this kind of action. Um, okay, so the thing is that with the book lovers, we have been, it's a practice-based research project, yeah? So for example, to the question, like I said before, how do you show a novel? We answer it in practice by showing it, yeah? But I still felt that we were missing some kind of theoretical ground. Like practice was not enough. Again, because there was not even a book about the artist novel. So I thought, okay, um, I will do it. If nobody writes it, I will write it. <laughs> so I started a PhD um, in 2014 in the uh, Edinburgh College of Art. And like I said, Maria Fusco was my supervisor and Jane McKee. So I had these uh, two supervisors. And I chose to do what in the UK, well, in the UK, when you study art, uh, art PhD, you have two options. You can do what they call thesis only, by which you write, say, a conventional, air quote, quotations, um, conventional uh, academic thesis of 100,000 words, yeah? Just a regular thesis. But you can also go for practice-based, which is, well, in my case, it was more practice-led, actually, uh, which is 50-50. So you still have to write an essay of 50,000 words, and the other 50% is practice, which is defined by the nature of your own project. Um, so I will speak about the practice 
thing in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, like Pia said, uh, well, after I finished the PhD, I published it with Moose Publishing. So now it's in two volumes. And uh, well, I brought a copy. So if you want to take a look, uh, uh, I think they are over there. Or you can even you pass it around. Yeah, the red one only. And then the other one. Well, OK, both. No, OK, both. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. So uh, here in a new medium, uh, this is the theoretical element. So at least uh, where there was, I, I don't know if it's good or bad, I don't know. But at least where there was nothing, now there is something. At least now there is one book written about the artist novel. So um, I did a lot of interviews. Um, it also contains the bibliography of artist novels. And for four case studies. Every chapter is focused on one case study. Uh, Benjamin Serox, uh, Meme Radio, Kali Spooners, uh, Collapsing in Parts, My Two Perret, um, uh, Chris, The Crystal Frontier, and Golding and Senevis, Headless. Those are the main four uh, case, uh, case studies that I study. Um, but then when I was uh, you know, doing my PhD, uh, one of the things I uh, understood about the artist novel, and this is very important, is that the contents of the work, when we are speaking about the artist novel, the contents of the work are not only contained in the text printed on the pages of the novel, but also in the process of creation. I will repeat it. When we speak about an artist novel, the content of the work happens not only on the text, but also while at the creative process, when the text is produced, is created. That is also part of the work. I will give you an example. <laughs> there is an artist novel, it's called Philip, by artist Heman Chong. And what he did was to invite eight people who didn't know each other and put them in a room for uh, one week. And they, he gave them the challenge to write a science fiction novel. And again, uh, I think there was one or two writers maybe among them, but most of them were not. And they didn't know each other. And in one week, they couldn't leave the room without <laughs> having written an art, a novel, an artist novel, which is called Philip. Now, OK, it's out. You can read it. Now, the point is, if you read Philip, at face value, like you would read a novel by uh, Philip K. Dick or any other science fiction writer, you will find it's a bad novel. Yeah? Why? Because it's full of mistakes and inconsistencies. Again, air quotes. For example, you read that a character is described as being bald. OK, fine. But three pages later, he's combing his hair. You know, is but these mistakes or errors are a, 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 a consequence of the creative process. You see, so if there was one person trying to write a novel, yeah, you would say this person has no control over his narrative. He's a bad writer, whatever, whatever. But here is a testimony of the creative process of negotiating things that normally a writer doesn't have to negotiate with anybody. Yeah, here. There are eight people, and they have to discuss everything about characters, plot, whatever. So of course, there are mistakes. Of course, there are tensions. Of course, there are moments where the, yeah, it's not well written. But th that's the point. You should not, that's my advice, you should not read an artist novel like you read a novel, because it's not the same. You are going to be, make a mistake, because first, you will think it's a bad novel. Second, you are going to miss the point of the work. The point of the work is not to write a good science fiction novel. The point of the work was to have eight people for one week, et cetera, et cetera. You see what I'm trying to explain? So the eight weeks in the room are already the work, are already the artist's novel. It's already part of the work. You cannot do without it. When you are reading, Philip, you should know that. Otherwise, you are missing the point of the, of the, of the artist's novel, and you are reading it as a regular novel, and then, therefore, you will think it's a bad novel. 
Is it clear? Yeah? OK. So if the process is so important, then I was making, I was missing something in my research because I was uh, researching artist novels after the fact, after they were published. I was researching artist novels and reconstructed the, reconstructing the creative process by means of interviews, um, uh, documentary, uh, how do you say, uh, archival materials, et cetera, et cetera. But I was not accompanying the process. I was not there. I was reconstructing it uh, in retrospective. So I thought I should actually, if, if the process is so important, I should research the process as well, not just the book, yeah? Okay, so now everything is coming together. <laughs> just one second. I hope it's not too boring so far. Okay, so at the same time, Joanna was curator of the performance department in Ujazowski Castle. In, it's an art center in Warsaw. So we proposed the, this art center to, uh, to publish an open call. So uh, we would support the creation, of, uh, the production of a new artist novel, okay? So what we offered was two years of production and the publication of the artist novel. So in the open call, we asked for uh, art projects of any kind. The only condition was that a novel had to emerge through these two years. That was the only condition, like do whatever you want, but a novel had to come out at some point, yeah, and we will publish it. So that was the only condition. So we got 230, uh, 100, sorry, 200, 230 applications from all around the world. And uh, long story short, we selected one by Italian artist uh, Alex uh, Cecchetti. And his project was called Tamam Shoot. So he claimed by, that by means of five episodic perform performances and one exhibition, he would uh, create a, a murder mystery narrative that then he would write up as a novel, yeah, in two years. Okay, so we selected this, um, uh, his project. Um, again, uh, Ujazdowski Castle would put the money and the resources. Johanna and I would be the curators and Alex would be the artist doing his thing. Um, but then I thought, okay, this is a gold uh, opportunity to research the process. So I could observe and accompany the process of creation of an artist novel from the moment of what I call the fantasy of the novel, when the artist is fantasizing, oh, I want my novel to be sold in airports or whatever, the whole trajectory until the end when the novel is actually published and it has a, a social life yeah, in the world. So I could observe and uh, study and research the whole thing. So, I decided to use Tamam Shoot as a key case study. But before I speak more about my research on Tamam Shoot, I will explain Tamam Shoot itself. Um, so like I said, he came up with a plan of five episodic performances. Uh, this was uh, the, f ep the first one, episode one, titled When Everything is So Clean, It is Difficult to Remember Something. So as you can see, uh, there was music, there was uh, a lot of um, interaction with the audience. So okay, so this is Alex uh, interacting with the audience and the two people with wigs are Johan and I. I don't know why, but he asked us to put on this um, 17th century um, wigs or 18th century. Um, so second episode was in Paris in uh, Cité des Arts. It was a guided tour through the garden and explaining the properties of seemingly uh, banal vegetation that had crazy stories behind or poisonous properties or whatever. Then episode three was back in Warsaw. It was in a um, museum. So he did a guided tour through the museum and he did it through spaces that are normally not open to the to the public. And here, uh, he invited two other performers to be part of this guided tour. Uh, this is Tim Etzels. And this is um, Ola Masiejewska. 
um, as you can see, she's uh, a dancer and she has a research uh, based on uh, Louis Fuller's uh, serpentine uh, dance, of course. So she's there, hidden somewhere in all this fabric. Episode four, uh, reading the unwritten. As you can see, uh, uh, Alex was uh, creating three new, three new chapters of uh, Tamam Shoot by reading tarot cards with the help of uh, some members of the audience. And this is Walking Backwards, is uh, the last uh, episode. Uh, it was again a guided tour in the, in the Botanic Garden in Warsaw, but it was, uh, yeah, Walking Backwards. So you had a guide. At, so the lady here is the, the, a member of the audience and the other person is a guide. So the guide was not touching you, was guiding you with their voice. So you were walking backwards. It was a very cinematic experience in that you could, you were th seeing things, vegetation and plants and flowers getting into your field of vision. And then the story was being told, yeah, in your ear sometimes, in the other ear, it was a little bit, yeah, very cinematic. And then the exhibition, which was also very performative, uh, here in, uh, it was divided in rooms, here in the dining room, People could actually order dinner. The menu was uh, designed by Alex. And in the menu, when you open it, you could read only poems. Um, so it was all about transformation. You read a poem, you got a dish. Um, here is the dance room. Well, I'm, I'm summarizing everything very brutally because, you know, otherwise <laughs> we can spend hours here, but... Uh, and this is the music room. For example, here the transformation was that all these paintings are uh, uh, paintings by Alex. What he did, uh, he asked us to find a musician with synesthesia. So synesthesia is a neurological condition that in his case, he saw colors and he heard sounds, okay? It's like in your brains and wires are crossed so you get a sensorial input, but it results in another one, yeah? So in his case, he could hear colors, yeah? So he's a musician too. So Alex gave him like a lot of his watercolors and what this musician wo did was to select a bunch of them and order them in the sense that he composed a musical piece. I, I, am I explaining myself? So of course, the sound only sounded in his head. So this that you see for everyone was just paintings. For him, it was a musical uh, annotation. So he could play in the piano, yeah? And then he translated that into conventional uh, music notation, but for other people to actually play. But so you see the whole thing was about transformation. And of course you had an exhibition and you had a novel eventually so it was all about that and then there were detectives in the room uh, <laughs> so these were performers that were just walking around and they were interacting with the audience and then she had a key that would open secret artworks so you know if you interacted with her she could open this secret box in the wall for example and show you some secret drawings secret drawings and, and etc all right, so um, after two years and almost a half, uh, we came out uh, with his uh, artist novel, Tamam Shoot. Um, so this is the inside. You s Tamam Shoot? Yes, uh, Tamam Shoot. Oof. Uh, <laughs> um, how can I? Okay, so in 1948, um, <laughs> sorry, you asked. In 1948, um, in uh, Australian beach, uh, a, a body was found, a dead body. And it's an unresolved mystery until now. Nobody knows who this guy was or why he died or the, uh, or the cause of death. Nobody knows if it was poisoned or natural death. It was a, it's a complete mystery. The only thing that was a, a bit of a clue was a piece of paper in his pocket that unrolled uh, would say the words tamam shoot. And then 
researchers, investigators, found out that those were the last words of a book of poems by a Persian uh, uh, writer, a poet, from the 12th century called Omar Khayyam. And his book is called the, the, the Kubayat, I think. Oh, man, um, I'm making a mistake. But it, the, I think it's the Kub Kubayat. I will check it out, OK? People in the internet don't kill me. It's, it's actually a very famous book. Uh, but I'm going to, well, anyways. So uh, Rubayat, sorry, Rubayat. So it's a book of poems from the 12th century Persian author. Uh, or, um, and then um, Tamam Shud in, in Farsi, if I'm correct, means uh, something like, um, well, the book is about uh, <laughs> carpe diem and you know enjoy the moment and uh, live uh, for the moment. I mean, there is a lot to tell because then uh, investigators found in a nearby parked car some weeks later, some people came that somebody had thrown a book inside their car, which was a, 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 a copy of the Rubayat that was missing exactly the words tamam should, therefore somebody had you know, ripped it off. And on the back cover, there was a secret code. And I mean, the story is super crazy. If you want, you can look it up or read my novel. <laughs> um, but yeah, tamam should are the last words of the book of poetry, uh, the Rubayats. And in Farsi, they mean something like, um, I will, I don't speak Farsi, so. Yes, because, uh, like I said, the this artist novel is, an, is a murder mystery novel, which is inspired on the actual case of the Somerton Man. That's how this case is called, because this body was found in the Somerton Beach in Australia. So um, Tamam Shud is, finds a kind of loose inspiration on this actual mm, murder mystery that, like I said, hasn't been solved till now. Although I think I found the solution. I think I did, but <laughs> seriously. But again, it's in the novel. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, so yes, Alex took it because it's the last words of this book of poems, and again, because it was the words found in the pocket of this victim. And then again, the, he wrote this novel uh, from the point of view of the victim after death. So uh, the, the protagonist finds out that he's death, that he's dead, and he starts an investigation on his own death. But he also doesn't remember who he is, so everything goes together, not finding out who he was and why he was murdered. Etc. But, but yes. Yeah. It's because we were the curator. So this is your, your initiative to, to find it, out. it was him, his decision. But I think it, you're right. It might be the first book ever published that has an artist novel on the cover because uh, there are many cases of artist novels that they say a novel on the cover and those cases are like for example uh, those books that you wouldn't identify as a novel when you open them and then the author finds necessary to clarify this is a novel like for example think of Andy Warhol's a, a novel, you know it, yeah? So he made a transcription of 24 hours in the life of one of the actors of the factory. So it's a literal transcription. It's, uh, um, there is no transformation into dialogue characters. It's like literally coughing sounds, everything is there. There is no plot, it's just rumbling for 24 hours. So the novel is very much unreadable, like any uh, of Andy Warhol's movies are unwatchable, yeah? You don't sit down and watch The Empire State for 11 hours. I mean, you can. But yes, yes. So the point is, in, in uh, a, a novel is, in my opinion, is, again, it's more 
close, it's closer to conceptual art than, act, than an artist novel in the sense that you don't need to read it, okay? The idea is what the work is about. But anyway, the point is that if you open it, you are not going to identify this text as a novel. So he clarifies that on the cover, a novel. Same with Joseph Kossuth. It's a, uh, it's a, every page is, um, is a page from another novel. So it's very, very hard to read. So again, by putting a novel on the cover, it means that you are preparing your expectations. You are entering into reading a novel mode. You see what, what I mean? You are not reading a, a book of IKEA instructions or a cookbook. You are reading a novel. Your, your mind is prepared with that, and then ksh, subverted expectations, whatever you want to call it. And that was that's the shock value. That is exactly what they want to subvert. Yeah. So that's the only instances where I saw a novel on the cover. But an artist novel, yes, to my knowledge, this would be the first time. And of course, is because Alex was working with us for two years and a half. <laughs> so, so he was really, you know, uh, soaked into the whole discourse and narrative about the artist novel. So, you know, he wanted to identify his as an artist novel. But we didn't force him. We didn't even ask him. It was his own initiative. Um, okay. So what you see on the margins of the pages is actually what is called um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sometimes things uh, escape me. I, I forgot the name. But if you see um, the book, when it's addressed, has a blue color around, yeah? When you put the pages on Iceland, you are going to see a fresh rose. When you put them in the opposite direction, you are going to see a dead rose, like a dry rose. So yeah, the book, the novel is full of all these kind of, you know, secret messages, etc. Okay, um, wow. I'm, I didn't even finish part of it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go a little bit faster now because uh, as I said, I was using Tamam Shud as a, uh, as a research method, basically. I was re uh, using an art project. But the important thing here is that I wasn't researching my own artist novel. The artist was Alex, not me. But again, I wasn't like an external observer either. I was somewhere there at the right distance, I think. I wasn't totally out. I wasn't at the center of it. I was somewhere there. So what I did was to accumulate a lot of uh, notes and a lot of um, uh, documentary materials, of course, recordings, and a lot of stuff. But then how do you make that into a PhD thesis? I thought if I, if the practice-based element of my PhD was a documentary, yeah, like um, archival um, documentary of the project, I would have missed those elements that actually I wanted to really speak about. And, well, hold on a second. First, I will. Oh, what a pity. I had a um, transition here that would open the pages like a curtain, but I think I removed it. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Um, okay, so what I call uh, um, informal situations, everybody who I is in the art world knows what it, this is about. I will give you an example. Um, there was a situation in which Alex, uh, we introduced Alex to the vice director of the Ujazdowski Center, okay? So they had lunch and Alex was, uh, you know, really charming him. And, you know, he did almost like a performance only for him, showing him his drawings while he made a wonderful impression. Okay, fine. And three weeks later, we had to discuss, the creators and the directors, uh, the fact that Alex was going overboard with the budget, like really a lot of money, like really a lot. He was spending much more money than we allocated to his project. But then this uh, vice director said, okay, it's not a problem. <laughs> like if I do that, you know, the creators would kill me, but why is not a problem? Because three weeks later, uh, earlier, Alex had charmed this director. What I want to say is that in the art world, 
things are, you know, subjected to what I call the informal factors of the art world. Things are possible or not, well, depending on the personal relationship. Um, do you need 10,000 euros? Or, or even when you go to a museum, like why is this artist here and not another 100 that are as good as this artist? Like, there is no formal answer to this. You cannot give a serious answer to this. To answer that, you have to take into account this, um, you know, what I call informal factors, uh, which are always circulating. This kind of knowledge circulates in the art world, in, the, in, in oral transmission, as uh, gossi gossips or anecdotes, but they are rarely committed to writing. But if I wanted to really explain how an artist's novel comes to be, I had to take into account also these elements, yeah? So, in other words, narrating, telling a narrative of how the whole artistic process went was, came, appeared to me the, 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 the best way to do justice to the process. You see what I mean? So, I could turn conversations into dialogues, uh, people into characters, and I could, you know, introduce voices of people who were not necessarily mine. Um, I could uh, really also explain what happened before the performance, after the performance, the reaction of the audience, put me, uh, put the point of view on the people, on the audience's uh, reactions uh, in their heads. And uh, so, you know, things that if I had opted to show just like documentary material, like photos or videos, I would have never been able to uh, ha get access to those uh, aspects of the experience that I wanted to 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 give an account of. All right, so at the end, by the extension of it, it became a novel. <laughs> so the, the practice-led element of my uh, research is a novel called The Fantasy of the Novel about the process of creation of an artist's novel. Yeah? So except one case, I didn't change the names of people involved. I asked permission to everyone. So um, I wanted to create what uh, Spanish writer uh, Enrique Villamatas calls the reality effect, meaning that I had to be very careful with the administration of fiction because this is not a novel. It's a work of research. So if the reader has the impression that I fabricated the events, this could undermine the research value. I could have said, yeah, a UFO came and beamed down the novel, the Tamam shoot, and this is how it was created. Yeah, okay, maybe it's a good story, I don't know. But I'm not researching anything. So I had to be very, very careful. At the same time, I couldn't do without fiction because if I was just giving an account of what happened every day, like this happened, this happened, and then this, this they, it would be a report of things. It would be, but not a novel. It's just a kind of diary. So I had to administer fiction very, very carefully so that this uh, reality effect is still there in the sense that if you Google anything I say in the novel, like this performance happened here and then, if you Google it, you will find out that I didn't make it up. It actually happened. And every single person there said what, I, what they say. So you see what I'm, I had this very thin line to walk between creatively maneuvering around the facts and being faithful to the process, of course. So I included some drawings uh, instead of photos to emphasize a little bit the um, subjective point of view because My voice appears there as a narrator, but as you can imagine, I cannot, I cannot claim that things happen that way. What I claim is I remember them this way. Yeah. So the story is told in the past tense as somebody that remembers things, and also in the first person. So I'm not rejecting the subjectivity that is in it is actually part of the work, yeah? And the drawings just uh, emphasize that. So as you can see, um,
Pardon? What does it mean? Yeah, I guess so, but uh, <laughs> I didn't write a PhD about uh, writer's drawings. I'm an artist, and I, ma I make drawings, and I make wall paintings. Yeah, but okay, visual artist. Um, so I am an, uh, an artist, like I said. Um, so what I do sometimes, like in this case, uh, the exhibition that you saw in Granada, there was an extra room. And here I was showing the fantasy of the novel. Again, a copy for people to read. And then I made a few wall paintings, murals, that are uh, directly coming out of the drawings from the novel. So what I did was to, here you can see again in the dancing room, all the wall paintings are uh, connected by the, this visual theme of the spiral, yeah, like, Ola Masayevska's uh, Serpentine Dance, the spiral dance uh, and movement. And the novel had marks where you could find the passage that made reference to those murals. And every mural, vice versa, had a little text that was an ex excerpt from the novel going back. So there was this kind of coming back and forth between the murals and the novel. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you feel. I can go faster now. Eh? <laughs> how do you feel? Um, this is short, eh? I promise this is shorter. Eh? Okay, so um, what happens after my PhD? I published it, as you saw it, uh, ad adaptation of it, of course. And then, uh, well, you know, your interests just keep evolving. I'm still interested in writing. But instead of on the symbolic value of writing, i have more invested now in the indexical uh, value of writing. What does it mean? Writing as a trace writing as a mark, as a sign that betrays the physical presence of somebody who is now absent. So you don't even need to know what is written. You just know that it's a mark that proves that somebody actually existed. Of course, handwriting, but there are other ways of doing that. So um, this is a novella that I wrote. Uh, as you can see, it's very recent. The title is Not All of Me Will Die. But the thing is that I wrote it only in one copy and by hand. Okay, So again, it has drawings, as you can see on the right page. But as you can see, I only wrote it once in a book, hardcover, and I wrote it by hand. Yeah. Now, the novella is about memory, death, and the desire of posterity, the desire to be remembered after death. Because I think that even if we don't say it out loud, what is common to writers and artists is the desire to leave something there that will be here even after you are gone. In other words, of course, as an artist, you want to establish a dialogue with your contemporaries. That's very important. But Secretly, or maybe not so secretly, I at least, and I think many of us do entertain the secret desire to, you know, that your work remains significant even after you are dead. So this is what the novella is about. It's a fictocritical novella, so it's not just a straight narrative. Okay, so what is special about this novella? Well, I publish it, but I don't publish it going to a printer is not reproduced with mechanical means. What I do, I fast forward a little bit, one moment. I publish it by means of performance. So when I do this performance, everybody who comes to the performance receives a blank book, exactly like mine. And what I do is to read the whole novella. I dictate it for five hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> 
So you see, this is exactly how uh, books were made before Gutenberg. Uh, it's like medieval monks. One reads from the original, let's say, and the other just copies. So uh, every time I do this performance, there are new copies made, as many as participants in the performance. I did it three times so far, uh, once in Stockholm, in Index. Ten people came, ten copies were made. Then in a, in yes yes in a second uh, the second uh, uh, round were seven copies in France in a gallery uh, La Box and then more recently in Rotterdam ten copies so there are twenty seven copies out there I think when I reach forty or fifty I will be satisfied thinking that it sounds more like an edition yeah forty fifty twenty seven is still a bit like. Uh, N not quite there. No. Uh, how do you make a copy of it? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course you can. <laughs> if they want, I doubt they will. But, uh, okay, so it's a moment of production, but it's also a moment of distribution. Answering your question, uh, you keep your copy. You take it home, which means that there are 10 copies in Sweden, 10 in France, and 10 in, uh, sorry, seven in France and 10 in the Netherlands. So it's a moment of, um, look, I work with an editor. It has an ISBN number. So I followed all the steps to publish a book. The only difference is that I don't use a machine to make the copies. I do it by means of performance. That's the only difference. But what happens is that, as you can imagine, probably, you're already thinking that every copy is a copy of the same novella and at the same time is wildly different. Not only because everybody has a different handwriting, but also because uh, there is a certain um, ambiguity in the act of dictation. I dictate something, but that doesn't mean that everybody will write the same. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to get to that part in a second. <laughs> so, um, here. <laughs> I will explain this in a moment. Uh, hold on. So you can see that at the end there are as many versions as people uh, come to the performance. Now, I don't want to exhaust people, okay? So every hour we take a break. There is a coffee table and, you know, the point is not to exhaust people. So um, <laughs> after five hours, more or less, I wrote the novella to be performed. So I did tests to know when, how long I could dictate without people giving up. Okay, so I, I, it's exactly at that moment, like when people start to feel pain and their arms are sore because we are not used to handwrite so much. At that moment is when it stops. Also, the story is meant to be, think about this. When you write, you are responsible for what you write. Okay, you have an idea or whatever, and it goes all the way from your brain to your, through your arm to your hand, and you give it external expression by writing. You write what you want to write. It's your responsibility. But here, when you are writing at the, the dictation of somebody, you are a passenger, so to speak. You are not responsible for what you write. In other words, you read at the same time as you write. Yeah? You understand the text while you are writing it. And I also prepared the novella to be performed in that way. There is a moment towards the end when all the narrative threads come together and then the people in the performance understand like, ah, okay, that's why we've been four hours here. So it's meant to be performed, okay? So it's, it's, it's really 80 pages, again, extension that I thought it was maximum. Now, about the drawings. It has four drawings. Um, so. For example, here in, in Rotterdam, what I did was to show first for a month, it was an installation. And in the installation, there were murals, there were the sculpture, there were drawings, and the, the novella itself, a little bit like a sacred book here. You see, it is a little bit like the Quran or the Bible or something. So in a normal day, people would just see art works, yeah, murals, whatever. An artist book, okay, fine, you read a read a page, uh, a, a bread made of tar, a 
portrait of Gilgamesh. Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the first um, major work of literature ever written, etc., uh, etc. Et so when I am dictating and I get to the point when there is a drawing, I stop dictating and I show the drawing or the mural for five minutes. So people have five minutes to make a copy. of. So what I mean is that during the exhibition time, this is an installation. But the last day, when I put the table and the books and everything, I open up the glass box, I fish out the novella, and I read out loud. And the status of these pictures change from murals or artworks to props of a performance. You see what I mean? They are now part of the performance. They get activated in that way. So during that day, there is no installation anymore. They become props. Yeah, They are models that people have to copy. So uh, look at this again. And look at this. So <laughs> There is no right or wrong way, yeah? Like, there is no right way to write or make the drawing or wrong. It's just, you know, just as it, as it comes out. So, yeah, the story mixes, um, the story is, it's a little bit an investigation on the uh, origin of writing in ancient Mesopotamia mixed with investigation around the death of my grandfather in the Spanish Civil War in 1936. He's still in a mass grave. So I'm, the novella mixes both, yeah? What is to be remembered and why and writing connected to, like in Gilgamesh, the desire to be remembered after death, yeah? Uh, all right, so... Um, when I investigate the origin of writing, um, what I try is to create what I, uh, what I call a transtemporal experience. That means to actualize experiences that happened in the distant past, but not to think about them, but to actually make them present again, to actually reactualize them. So here you have the Royal Game of Ur is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, board games ever invented by humans. It was found in the city of Ur in the south of what now is Iraq. Um, the game was uh, very popular 5,000 years ago. So copies of it were found in a royal uh, grave. Uh, so I made my own version and what I did was also to investigate a little bit and there was this curator from the British Museum who reconstructed the rules of the game. So um, what I do when I show it is I explain the rules. They are fairly simple, and I invite people to play it. So people can play the game. And what I mean by transtemporal experience is that the game remains surprisingly uh, fresh and exciting. And it's a very good game. It's not You can actually still play it. It's, it's a good game. You can play it for 20, 30 minutes. And you know the moments of excitement that you go through, the, the happiness if you win, or the disappointment when you lose, they are real. You know what I mean? The, you are experiencing something very similar to what people experienced 5,000 years ago when they played the same exact game, if you see what I mean. So there is no analytical understanding of the past. You are literally reenacting it and having the same emotions that people had or hopefully the same very similar emotions that people had 4,000 years ago. This game uh, lost popularity in the first century after Christ, so uh, it's, it's a little bit of a reconstruction now. I'm going a little bit fast now, yeah? Um, so I'm lucky to be uh, collaborating with the Netherlands Institute of the Near East um, in Leiden, and they have a collection of 3,000 cuneiform clay tablets. So I approached them a couple of years ago asking if they had a tablet that, was, uh, that hadn't been translated yet, therefore not read since the moment it was written. So 
if I'm going too fast, you tell me, yeah? because um, these tablets uh, they found is a letter. It's a letter of a son to his mother. What you see up there is the envelope. So this letter um, was written in Old Assyrian. Uh, is from 1850, more or less, BC. So it's almost 4,000 years old. So it was sent by a son to his mother. And the point is that it was found at destination. Okay, So the letter arrived to the place where the mother lived, but it was found unopened. It was found in its case. If you see the way they wrote letters, of course, in Mesopotamia, they didn't have a lot of trees, so they had a lot of sand and water from the rivers and sunlight. So they wrote on clay tablets, cuneiform script. And then when it was about a letter, they would make an envelope made of clay. Yeah, and then they would put a, uh, even the address C, the, the, uh, and then they would roll a, a, a seal around it. So the fact that the letter was found at destination but not open, it means that the mother never actually read it. But we do. I mean, I can read it for you if you want. So when I show this piece, the piece is not the tablet exactly. The, the piece is the tablet and me reading the tablet. And the, the, and the letter is about uh, family quarrels, uh, money issues, and the fear of disappointing your mother. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that these are issues we, a lot of us, can still relate to. And when you hear the letter, it really creates this connection with these people who existed almost 4,000 years ago. And this guy never wrote this letter for us. It's not a message to the future. It was a letter to his mother, period. But in, against all odds, we are the receivers, the recipients of this message. And even if we miss a lot of the context, there is still enough in the letter to, again, to connect at, at least at an emotional level with these people. So, um, of course, I cannot have the original because these letters are made in unbaked clay. They are very fragile. If you have sandy, uh, sweaty hands, you know, <laughs> it could melt. <laughs> so, um, so what they did was to uh, use a CT scanner, 1440 X-ray pictures made of the object, and with that information, they made a 3D reproduction, exactly like the original. And that's what I have, and that's what I show. But again, I don't show it per se. Some people think it's soap when they see this. The piece is the letter and me reading the letter. I can read it later if you want, or now. <laughs> if you are too tired, I can read it now, or I can read it later. Should I read it now? Yeah? Yes? OK. It's not very long. OK. So imagine that uh, on the outside of the envelope, there is a bit of writing, which is the addressee and also the subject line, exactly like we do now with emails. Yeah, We put what, it, what the letter is about outside. So the subject line says, the envelope says, to Mamala. Mamala is the name of the mother. Seal, the seal that is used to roll around, belongs to Asur Samsi. So that's the name of the guy, young guy. By the way, he was a merchant. I have to clarify this, a young merchant trying to do business, not very well, as you will understand now, inside what is now Anatolia. Now, it, we don't know where the father is. Maybe dead, we don't know. But it's clear that the father is absent. So he's trying to take over the business, maybe a bit too young. So the subject line says, the servant girl has no sense. I will finish her case and send her away. You despise me. Who does not experience losses? That's the subject line. When they speak about servants, uh, you have to understand that in the context of ancient Mesopotamia, they are probably talking about the slaves. And then the tablet itself, the letter says, speak to Mamala. This is what Azur Samsi says. 
When I was on my way to you, the merchant took away from me one pound of silver. I had to travel after him. I will come within 10 days. Should I not come, I will send copper, five or six pounds. Asur Rei, the deaf, brought one and a half pounds of copper to you. Do you not hear that the country of Kunanamit is in revolt? It's not convenient to demand payment from people who owe as little as 10 pounds of copper. I say, you will certainly experience welfare for all the hardship you had. You despise me and you even sold the girl. Moreover, you do not take care of the boy. Now then, divine Asur certainly knows your actions. I say, now then, you are my mother. Would you hate me? Trying to send money home, not very good at it. Making excuses for not sending enough money. The mother has to sell slaves. Probably an answer to an angry letter from the mother. It's like, don't be angry at me, etc. Okay, and the last piece I want to show is not a piece yet. I'm doing this research in the Netherlands Institute of the uh, near, for the Near East, like I said, and I found. Uh, they have 3,000 cuneiform clay tablets. So what I was looking for is non-linguistic traces in clay tablets. Uh, fingernails, fingernail prints, fingerprints, a lot of traces that are trapped in the clay when it was fresh 4,000, 5,000 years ago, and it's still there. Now, I found this is a school exercise. Why is it a school? Normally, when it's round, old Babylonian tablets is a school exercise. So I'm not reading the text. I don't even know what it says. The point is, I found out that it has five um, imprints of five fingers around the edges. So it's probably, maybe, that the kid was nervous. Was it an exam? I don't know, but he was surely pressing the tablet when it was fresh, a little bit too hard. And he left the f five fingers of his hand. Actually, I, when you put your hand around these uh, imprints, you can actually feel his hand in a way. So you are kind of filling up the filling up the gaps. You are filling up the absent hand of that person. Yeah, I asked the scholars at the institute and they uh, what they thought about all these non-linguistic traces, and they had never seen them. It's a bit crazy if you think that these tablets have been there for uh, about a hundred years. They are focused on the text, translating the text, and uh, studying the text. It seems like they didn't pay so much attention to the tablets as material objects. And well, I want to finish the talk today saying that I'm I'm not a I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not an archaeologist. I'm an artist. But I was talking to one of them, a, a scholar, a retired scholar, who said that actually this photo could give answer to a mystery that they had in Assyriology for a long time, that they didn't know how they held the tablets in their hand. <laughs> they didn't know if the, you know, they were writing like uh, parallel to the hand or 90 degree or 45. If you put your hand in the missing hand, suddenly you see the direction of the script. So, well, I don't know. It seems like I stumbled upon something that they were uh, asking for a long time. What I want to say is that um, there is value in artistic research, and even if you are dealing with um, disciplines that are not your own, the fact of coming from a different perspective, it can actually add some value to your own point of view because it's kind of fresh. Okay, you don't know a lot of things, but that might be actually sometimes an advantage. And... Uh, well, I guess I will, oh, I also made a um, transition here. It was like a bird flying away, but for some reason, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, and uh, we'll make a 10-minute break now, and then everybody on YouTube can um, join the Zoom. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>